the tides of life are an endless cycle merging man and God as one. Skip you up. <laughs> All right, what's up, everyone? I'm here with Tony Lane Casterly. We are at Brain Mind at Stanford. We got a chance to hang out together. It's been a while since we featured Tony on our show. How long has it been? It's been like six months. Yeah, not six, maybe five. Four? five yeah, four, four five. or five. Okay, so it's been a little while. So, first thing that we started talking about was about light dark about masculine feminine about interdimensionality just about all these different forces that exist that it's difficult to put a tangible grasp on so let's keep diving into what we were talking about because it's been so fascinating sure yeah so we were talking about i mean this conversation really started with the idea of what is the human relationship to consciousness in the perspective of time. You were saying, I feel like light forces are coming into the world, right? And they're just like, we're, we're conquering, we're conquering that age of darkness. And my follow up to that was, have you ever heard of the Hindu concept of time as a yuga? So the yugas basically break time up into four different dimensions, starting with the Satya Yuga and ending with the Kali Yuga. And the difference between Hindu time and our spatial relationship to time is like one line. You know, time, by the way, we'll get into time because time isn't a line, really, or a circle. Time is a dot. Time is a dot, and it's happening all at once. It's just that different dimensions of consciousness perceive time differently based on the amount of consciousness that that subjective consciousness is perceiving the holistic consciousness with. But, okay, okay, yeah. okay, this is... This is getting into, we need to break down. We need to break this down. <laughs> okay. All right, unpack, unpack. So, all right, so we have time as a dot, time all happening at once at the mm-hmm. same time. And when you kind of made this point earlier, we think in a very earth centric way. Yeah. And so, because of that, we have this sort of timeline of time. Yeah. But is the universe not 13.8 billion years old? Well, not exactly. So, I mean, when, we, but we're, when you say the universe, right? We have no idea. The spectrum of the known universe. There might not even be a, a starting or a stopping point, right, in this. It, it might not be that um, something has to be created for it to exist, right? So there are, some, there are some questions we just simply don't know the answer to yet. And if you look at Eastern, I don't know if you know what a Vajraha is. A Vajraha is this little symbol. It looks kind of like a, a, a barbell except it's very small in the center and it has these two big orbs on the side, so it looks kind of like this. And the Vajraha actually symbolizes in Eastern culture the nature of our relationship to the universe. That the universe kind of has this point and it expands and then it contracts and then it peters down and then it begins to expand again and contract again. And that's the the nature, yeah. the whole, we're going to the heat death or the cold death, we're going towards some death is potentially inaccurate that it might just go down to a bottleneck and come back up as another birth and yeah the, the, the multiverses as well and then interdimensionality wherever your spirit or your soul lives it's just living in this physical form right now is that right well the egyptians have no word for death so they actually call if you read like i don't Damn. know if you've read the tibetan book of the dead or the egyptian book of the dead they don't actually say dying they call it walking, like your soul walking. is walking, it's walking from one life to another. And if you look Damn. at Buddhist, like if you look at Buddhist literature, when they talk about, I actually ask this question of, well, what happens to life? Like if a soul decides it doesn't want to come back as a human, right? If, if a soul leaves its body and it, and it just goes, it just becomes energy, what happens to that energy? And the response that I received was that that energy goes back to all living things. If a soul fully transcends its body, that energy goes back to all living things. So it's the idea of there's a story called the egg. And if a soul transcends its body. Yes. So you have to go through a transcension process in order to attain this walking. 
explore? Well, so there's a difference between walking and a soul like transcending its body to the extent that it becomes other forms of energy. So if your soul is walking, then it means your soul has the intention to come back and experience the physical realm again, like as a uh -huh. bodhisattva. Uh -huh. But if your soul just becomes a form of energy, then that energy goes back to all forms of life. So you might imagine that there, your soul is potentially made up of every other soul that exists on earth because every time someone touches you, they leave an imprint. It's as if, imagine every time yeah, you yeah. have an exchange with someone, a really powerful, meaningful, deep exchange of energy, that they take a piece of their fingerprint yes. and they leave it on you. And that fingerprint transcends with you through the dimension of time because- Who inner, you yeah. are, you yeah. are molded in my mind. Yeah. Yeah. And also in my physical body. In and and in the in my physical body and in the energy that inhabits this this body, the energy that exists outside of what can be measured in physical form, non-physical matter. There is an entire dimension of non-physical matter that exists in the world of lucid dreaming and OBEs that we have yet to understand or quantify through science. And that's only one dimension of our quantum consciousness, right? Consciousness is not just confined to the human form. There's so many layers of this, but from a basic standpoint, if you have a lucid dream, if you have an out-of-body experience, you still exist, right? But do you exist physically? No. Mm. You exist as a form of energy. Mm. And that energy is not necessarily, it's still attached to your body through what we call like the string of light, the right? string of light. Yeah. Okay. So it hasn't fully, if you ever see your body in an out-of-body experience, a lot of people will describe this phenomenon called the string. And it's a string that is uh -huh. tethering. You can actually see this in Greek mythology. Do you, does the string get cut when? So, yeah, okay, okay. I was going to say, what did the faiths do? Have you ever seen Hercules, the Disney movie? Yeah. yeah. You know how there are those three ladies that are like, <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. and they all have the one eyeball that they use and they share, and the fates all use their one eyeball to see in different ways. And then whenever a soul goes to the underworld, the fates pull a string and one of them cuts it. And that is when the soul leaves the body, right? So, and there's a big difference between having that thread cut and actually deciding, making the conscious decision to, to leap. This is why books like the Tibetan Book of the Dead are actually instruction manuals for the soul to move through the dimension of actually leaving your physical body. There's a ton of literature on this. It's just that we, we haven't actually adopted this in popular Western science because we don't have the tools yeah, to yeah. measure phenomenons that we understand to be inherently true as human beings. We it's, are about to augment the scientific method and yeah. get us to the next iteration of yeah being able to understand this this is I, I, I stopped using the word esoteric because I think when you label it as more difficult to understand it draws people maybe away from it so rather I maybe we're maybe starting to use something more like just it's it's divine and it's and, and it requires practice of communicating like this and feeling like this in order for it to become more true and embodied it's like embodied wisdom but it's but it's it got lost over time due to focus on economics and politics and well and really our it's it actually has to do as well with our earth's relationship to the cosmos Right? So we were talking about the yugas earlier. And we have the Satya Yuga, which is like the golden age. It's the Garden of Eden. It's described as the period of time where gods and goddesses reign. When was that? So the Satya Yuga is actually represented as the period of time we're entering into from 2012 to 2018. Is the transition window into the Satya Yuga from the Kali Yuga. And the Kali Yuga is the age of degradation, basically. It's the golden calf. The worshiping of false idols, degradation, materialism, uh, the We're loss. Into that? No, no, no. We just left it. We just left it? it. So the Mayan prophecy. If you look at the Mayan how do we calendar, know that information. Like, how do we, how do we know that? How did they know that? This is thousands of years old. How it's did they... ancient wisdom. I mean, really ancient wisdom, and and you know, languages that in so many ways I call this the forgotten period of history. Because if we knew it was this good at one point in human history, if we would have known it had once been this good, I don't think we'd spend our time getting lost in yeah. all that darkness, yeah. right? But we, again, have not had the tools to transcend our Earth's relationship to the, the cosmos or the center of energy in the universe. And so we're locked into this cycle, right? Whether, you know, consciously or unconsciously for, for some or others. 
And so the Mayan calendar ends in 2012, not because it was meant to represent, you know, this like the world will end, but that this is the end of that particular age. The part yeah. of the sun orbiting the center of the Milky Way. You know, I don't, I don't want to say the Milky Way because I think that that is a really minute, like it's a known thing. The Milky Way is a... It's even the Milky Way orbiting something else or getting pushed away from all the other galaxies that might, minus Andromeda, just that the energies of the universe... I don't know. I don't know place. exactly. How do they know this information? How well, do they so know 2012, 2018 is... Yeah, it's the difference between Eastern... Marshall McLuhan even talks about this, the reversal of the Eastern and Western mentality. And the Western mentality is very much about measurement, logic, rigor, focus, like the idea of the self and the Eastern mentality is very much about the intuitive perspective and the understanding of the collective. This is why if you even look at Mandarin Chinese symbols, most of these symbols are intuitive symbols. And one little inflection can change the whole contextual relationship to a word and so we're moving back into this Eastern understanding is represented by ideas like Buddhism Hinduism where our concept of our relationship to consciousness is actually shifted right and so uh, yeah I think that's really and like I was saying earlier you know we have as w when we think about our earth what we're thinking about is how do we measure our earth and the known things even what you were just saying like to the Milky Way like, can we measure our Earth and then its relationship to the sun? And is that the center of energy in the universe? Or are we going to measure something else? And is that the center of energy? But it's all based on our logical understanding of what we can measure and perceive factually, rather than the intuitive understanding, the sensing of something and the feeling of something. And the feeling of something being understood so inherently as a collective that the feeling of something becomes a known. Yeah. Right, and so it's really just a reversal of those mentalities that informs our relationship to the structures of logic we use to even formulate our scientific discovery. And, what would yeah. be something that we would collectively feel in order to gain some intuition about life and existence? So this is an interesting question because we're in this transition period where we have a lot of these still really Western methods being brought into this more collectivist mentality. Like if we look at the evolution of whether it's singularity theory, neural nets, um, you know, Harvard and other institutions have done studies on brain to brain communication, right? So we're seeing these tools of measurements now being used to transition into this new way of thinking and into being. Um, if, if you, um, if you choose to view your relationship to time as rather than the earth as being on a its own discrete timeline as the earth being a very minute portion of an entire cosmology that exists outside of us it's really more about understanding our place in the cosmos from the perspective of the cosmos than it is about understanding our place on the earth in relation to what is known and measured yeah okay yeah. so there's there's that one so that, that that's a very important one it's kind of it's it's taking the the cosmic perspective that is not earth centric and it's not three dimensional centric okay so there's that and then there's this whatever is going on between realms or dimensions that we don't understand what these forces are some people apparently understand them better they figured out how to intuitively feel and tap into these places that are somehow earth is a is, is is earth a place of free will do you think so so i the line between uh free will and determinism is the same explanation i use i was actually asked a question on the, a panel i was speaking on yesterday and the panel was social good uses for blockchain technology and we had the most amazing amazing moderator that i've actually ever worked with and his initial question was, you know, talking about blockchain and social good rather than saying, let's talk about blockchain in relation to social good. It was Eric van der mm -hmm. and his relationship to rather than saying, you know, what are some social good use cases? He said, what is good? Right. And so when we talk about free will and determinism, you can't really have one without the other. And so it's really that you can't have bad without something to measure it against. So you can't have what is determined without a measurement of our free will in interacting with the spectrum of what could be determined. It's really like, a, 
I'm trying to think of the best explanation. It's like a mycelia, right? Like a mushroom and the way that you watch or understand something to grow. Like there is a, a set pattern underneath that this will become a mushroom, right? But if you really peer into the way in which something evolves, like the pattern underneath all of this is so, is so unbelievably dynamic, right? I think I was talking about mycelia when my friend called me, but it, it's kind of like saying, you know, there are a million different ways for life to evolve and that on even this planet Earth, since we've been alive, there could have been one action that happened when dinosaurs were here and that could have affected the evolution of hundreds of different kinds of species. Whatever occurred in the cosmos that sent that asteroid to impact Earth, whatever occurred, it ended up enabling humans to be born. I think that. So what, is, what, so what could that be? What, what, what about now? Now we have all this existential threat mitig mitigation. You're counting right now. So I wrote this haiku okay. about the meaning of life as relation in, in relation to what you just said about existence and the asteroid. And it is the tides of life, the tides of life are an endless cycle merging man and God as one. That's pretty good. I like that one. Nice. Woo! That's a really good one. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And do you think that's happening on other planets orbiting stars? So that's an unanswered question. Uh, that's an unanswered question. And I, I think that there, there are certain questions that it's kind of like, why would you want to ruin the fun? <laughs> there are certain questions that you cannot know the answer to that question until you reach the state at which that question can be answered. So in, in relation to kind of this free will and determinism and evolution, it's as though there are certain forms of knowledge that cannot be known until an individual through their will has reached a space of knowing that allows that information to be able to be understood. Okay. It's as if you're a child and you are three years old and you have someone looking at you asking you to read Hegel and you're like, whoa, I'm three. Like, what's up with like Sesame Street over here? Yeah, like, yeah. I'm having a good time with Big Bird and sure, Elmo sure. and Oscar too. So we're unable to comprehend right now because we don't have the tools needed to go and investigate and figure it out. Okay, well, if the purpose is this continuous emerging of, of human with with God, then... Higher states of consciousness. Higher states of consciousness. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Humans with higher states of consciousness, then have we not... How do we know we haven't already reached that point and now you're just... Because we exist. Well, yeah, but you could... Yeah, but you don't know if you're... You don't know if you're existing in a base reality or not right now. But we exist. And well, because we exist, we exist sure. if, we, if, if there was nothing left to learn and there was nowhere to evolve and there was nowhere to go, um, every form of energy would transcend into a state of bliss that would say, we're done. Like the puzzle's been, we've completed the puzzle here. Isn't that what it's going to feel like when we eradicate suffering? That like, oh cool, the puzzle's complete. Now people don't have sickness from drinking contaminated water. They have roofs over their heads. Isn't that going to be a good feeling? Why do we have to have this bad of, of suffering in order to know what it feels like to not have suffering? Can't we just not have suffering and still understand suffering just, to, just through other experiences that teach us about it? Well, I don't know if that's the point. Uh, but that is one of the most important lessons you need to learn to evolve into a higher state of consciousness is the idea of... Uh, seeing yourself outside of yourself and through the ability yeah. to see yourself interdimensionally, you're understanding that your relationship to the idea of suffering is you embodying illusion. And when you're able to dispel okay. the nature of your relationship to the illusion of existence, then you're able to understand more about the true untouched nature of reality, which is beyond that suffering. Let's see if I can break this down. So, so if if I can unpack properly to your liking. So <laughs> so so if if I ha if I don't have access to clean water and I get upset because I don't have access to clean water and I'm thirsty, 
and I'm getting sick from drinking contaminated water, that that suffering is a choice because I'm not transcending to a godlike level and a lot of what we need to do is figure out how to transcend to that godlike level. Mm, not exactly, like sort of yes, but the like idea of a uh, the idea of a godlike level and the well, if we understood yeah. our interdimensional being capacities and yeah. capabilities, then we wouldn't be stuck worrying about this water. We'd be like even if I die from drinking this contaminated water, I'm an intergalactic, interdimensional being, and and it doesn't matter that I die when I'm 10 or well, 30 or 100. And there are actually, I mean, if you dig really deeply into these gurus and monks, there are people, I have actually worked in specific um, with a priestess, her name is Alanya Forsberg, uh, she's Norwegian, and um, I have I have physically seen her do acts of consciousness uh, that I can only describe as extraordinary and metaphysical. Yeah. Seeing seeing gurus take sickness out of people's bodies, or being able to drink something contaminated without getting sick, being able to pull a vehicle with their hair that is full of tons of bricks. Right there are. Huh. feats that are possible that are unexplainable by a normal state of consciousness that are attainable to us as human beings and so there's only but there's really Damn, that really makes me feel like i know nothing and i'm just leveraging so little of my potential the only yeah. thing we'll ever know is that we'll always be learning because the what we really know at the end of the day is nothing and when you realize you know nothing then you can deal with everything as it comes yeah because it's not about the knowing, but yeah. it's about the balance between presence and our existence through time. Presence and our existence through time. But time's happening all at once. So time is a dot, right? Like it's the idea that uh, time is not happening in either or both in Eastern and Western mentality. Time is a dot. It's happening all at once and in many different dimensions. Uh, the same story I was talking about earlier called the egg. A man passes and talks to God and God tells, man, it's a very short story. God tells this person that they're going to be sent back in time to 457 AD to live as a, a peasant in, uh, a peasant farmer in China, as a female. This person says, what? And then God says, yeah, I mean, you're everyone. You're Hitler, and you're every person that he persecuted. You're Jesus, and you're every person that he saved. You're also the people that killed him, right? And so time is happening all at once. And our ability to see time or to see time in a different dimension than we perceive through physical existence mm. is something that I have found to be more accessible to people through dreams like if you look at indigenous nations you have people that do these that, that have these visions visions that are actually understood to exist visions colloquially that are understood to actually happen in the real world and there are many prophecies and there are many visions that have been seen through these dreams and through the human relationship to consciousness beyond the dimension of what exists merely subjectively for us and so I find that lucid dreaming, this lucid dreaming and these out-of-body experiences are a way for us to exist still within the state of our own consciousness while also transcending the nature of the present physical reality that exists around us. And in doing that, we begin to receive information in a different dimensional capacity. And when we receive that information, we begin to learn different lessons, many of which are still um, fortunately actually unmeasurable we as a human race in some ways are not uh it's like even if you evolve very far you gotta wait for everyone else to catch up you know it doesn't work that you evolve and then everyone else evolves any prophet that's ever lived could tell you that we have we're playing this endless game of catch up with the rest of the world but all of those people are a part of us too mm. Mm -hmm. is that potentially also has something to do with 
maybe that that feeling of of taking on other people's emotional state or maybe when we that that we are part of them in that moment you were talking about it earlier like you have a space in my body and my mind because you are you and we've hung out this many times etc let's uh let's let's wrap up just the this is this is very fascinating there's just there's something about this that i find to be a reoccurring thing now in my life yeah more, more so than ever before yeah. and i think carrying a perspective of open mindedness yeah. is very important for sure and that can lead us to having more of these conversations and a lot of it is the open mindedness but also it's i think i would say it's almost the open mindedness of the other person as well because yeah, there's open mindedness on my end of asking you questions and being open to listening and learning yeah. and there's the open minded of the other person when i'm asking these questions to people oh. that are that are not building things or talking about things that are very tangible in a sense but that are a little bit more like interdimensional and spiritual and stuff so I think it's open-mindedness is on their end as well in terms of just being okay with admitting that what they are saying might not be the 100% correct truth. And nothing is. That's kind of the beauty of life is that there is no 100% correct truth. There are things that we Are you we breathing oxygen right now? Can understand, right? There are things yeah. that we can understand. Okay. Right, but they're all subjective things. Actually, the oxygen example is a great one. What someone, about your heart beating? So, someone used the example: oxygen and gravity are two of my favorites. Okay. Right, because someone says, "Oh, you're breathing oxygen right now, so that must mean you're alive, or you exist, or you're here." I said, "Well, you know, oxygen isn't an absolute. Neither is gravity. We just go a few bits outside the Earth, yeah, and yeah. we have neither oxygen nor yeah, gravity." Yeah, but what about your heart? Your heart's beating to keep you alive, right? Well, in a physical sense. But I also exist in a body that doesn't have a heart. Where is that body? That's the body you experience in dreams. And I think that this open-mindedness... That's the body you experience in dreams. Yeah, okay. lucid dreaming out of body experience. So, so when, when you become aware of yourself in a dream state, then you are alive in the dream state and you are not conscious. Your physical form... You are. Lucid your, dreaming, you're conscious. You're, you're but your physical it. form is not conscious, Correct. but your your but physical then, form is. But your spiritual tether yes. is in dream state, and that is what's conscious. Yeah. Okay, so then your heart is still beating, though. But could we live? So, and I think here's the real question, right? The reason why I say, no matter how much you know, you'll never know anything. We could evolve to a state of human life where we don't need our bodies to live. And this is, the, I mean, to give a... Yeah, the, transcend the, biology. Well, yeah. to give the, the kind of like a dystopian example of this, I mean, where is, where is Neo in the Matrix? Yeah. Right? They're a yeah. bunch of humans who believe that they're alive, yeah. but they're just living in a vat. Yeah. Your body's in a Which vat could and be then right they now. exist. Yeah. yeah. And so it's one of these, exactly. So it's one of these ideas that when we say that we know... I believe that we actually limit our ability to engage in research. Now, can we do some of these super far out ideas uh, in an immediate context? Can we execute on those and make those things real rapidly? No. I mean, like I said, it takes the evolution of all to reach that point or the movement of all to reach a point of evolution, right? And so even if you move as one, you can make enough impact as you, you like as one to create the reality that you envision, but it's really the movement of all that will change that. I really liked what you described about how even though someone's moving forward at a very quick pace towards divinity, let's say, or merging with God, that other people might not be coming as quickly and that is all us that is all us and that it is all it's all up to us to help raise that vibe collectively together one one last thing that i think was really important that you mentioned yeah. um that we got to before we started recording which i thought was so interesting you were talking about this 
this uh, this feminine and masculine uh, compassion that exists. Yeah. And it was funny because when you said that the fem the feminine compassion of this like I love you, I love you, I care for you, um, that that sort of feeling, and then I was like, and then the masculine one is go execute, go yes. build, and you were just like, that's right, and I was like, wow, I can't believe that. That's so funny. Uh, so unpack that just a little bit more. Yeah. So we all embody these aspects of feminine and masculine compassion. And feminine compassion is very much nurturing, like, I've got you, you're safe, I love you, you're held. It's very womb-like. Mm -hmm. And there's a certain point... And that has to do with something about birth, a decent amount? Uh, in, in a certain sense, we were talking about the nature of our relationship to our capacities for intuitive intelligence and that in relation to childbirth yeah, and yeah, that yeah. why does it seem like women are more built for these intuitive capacities and men are more built for these logical capacities yeah yeah uh, and yeah, i think there okay. yeah mm -hmm. i think there's uh, many different reasons for that and most but most importantly to touch to circle back and really mm -hmm. touch on what you said yes. no matter what we think we know the only thing we'll ever know is that we'll always be learning and the only mm -hmm. way that we can ever hope to learn is to accept within ourselves that what we know is nothing Yes. What we know is nothing. We can we can understand something as law subjectively in a certain space and in a certain time in a subjective context, but that law is not an absolute if you're traveling through the space of the the cosmos, right? It's like there's nothing there's there's not the same dimension of consistency between these different levels of our relationship to existence. But masculine compassion, mm -hmm. right? It's like at a certain point when the child has all of this safety and all this love and all of the security and all of the nurturing, it's like, okay, I wanna play. Mm -hmm. I wanna play. Like, I'm good. I know that I'm safe here. I've had a good time. I'm fed. I'm not hungry. My diaper's good. I've got the milk and the juice box. And I'm like ready to hit the road, mom and dad. And then the child wants, the inner child even, wants like direction and action. It wants to do something. It wants yeah. to execute. It wants to build. And so masculine compassion is the action oriented. It is the go forth message that nurtures the, that nurtures the growth and that nurtures the evolution. And really it's that we both have all of these aspects in ourselves and we've really had a massive repression massive repression of masculine compassion um, especially in the United States over the last century a massive repression yes. of masculine compassion yes yeah, but it does also seem like a lot of the execution oriented tendencies that we have are still working well you think we've been executing with compassion we've been destroying our earth oh. destroying the planet like we haven't been we're executing, not executing with, compassion. with compassion so that's yeah. what's taken a toll in the last hundred years yeah. yeah okay execute with compassion you guys heard it here um, <laughs> yeah you, you you also heard tony lane casserly teaching us it's always such a pleasure and it just it doesn't even feel like we left yeah each other for a minute yeah yep. it's so interesting yeah yeah it's really cool and um, yeah whatever whatever time is and whatever interdimensionality is and spirits and unleashing them to their fullest i'm just in light and dark i'm just i'm so i'm like you said the one thing we know is that we know nothing and that we'll always keep learning yeah, yeah that was really good okay tony this has been a blast thank you so yeah. much for, yeah thank you thank you thank you thank you <laughs> okay thank you everyone as you guys heard go and build don't just consume go create much love everyone all right peace out Woo.